It's a blessing to be here tonight and to be able to share a few thoughts from God's Word with everybody. And if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We'll be reading the first six verses from Galatians chapter 5. And in a time when we're facing a pandemic and facing a, a global crisis, it seems that where the governments of the world have deemed certain things essential versus non-essential, um, I thought it'd be interesting tonight to discuss and to share a few thoughts on what seems to be essential in the Christian faith and perhaps some things that are not as essential and where our focus should be. And perhaps tonight we will have the opportunity to kind of refocus our thoughts and our minds, our hearts on the essential things of God's word um, as we look through the passages in Galatians and a few other passages. The title of my sermon tonight, if you like to take notes and like to have titles, I, I've titled it, What Really Matters? Again, what really matters? In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit by faith we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accounts for anything, but only faith working through love. Continuing down in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Amen. It's usually easiest to reflect on what matters in life when we're going through a tough time. I think all of us at one point or another in life where we have trials or tribulations, be it personally in our family, be it in our friend group, perhaps we lost a job or, or something happened, we tend to reflect more on our life, what really matters, what's important. And I think all of us are equally affected to some degree by this, by this pandemic that we're facing. And, and so perhaps we've had time to reflect on what really matters in our life, whether we want to focus more on our families, whether we want to focus more on, on certain things, or uh, we have more free time to do. And so tonight I would like us to I'd like to present just a few thoughts of, of what things really matter in the Christian faith. Um, you know, we live in end times, and we say that all, a lot. We live in the end times, and I, I really believe that we don't have the luxury or even the time to really focus on non-essential matters that we often focus as Christians and as humans. But instead, we ought to re, refocus our, our, our mindset, our hearts, on what's essential from the Word of God in order that we may live the last days that we have, be it a few days, be it a month, be it a few more years, um, in obedience to God's word and living for, for the word of God and for Jesus. And so looking here in Galatians, just to give a little summary of what's happening in, in, this, in the first few chapters, um, there's a tension in the church of Galatia. Paul had proclaimed the, the gospel to the church of Galatia. The church was formed by the spirit and they believed, they had faith, and by the Spirit, they were led in faith and believed in Christ Jesus, and they were saved. And so they started off great. They had faith in Christ, and they believed. And unfortunately, shortly after Paul departed from Galatia, somebody entered into the church and, uh, and kind of slid in there, the Bible says, and started preaching a different sort of message, a message that had to do with a different sort of gospel. Paul says it's not even, even a gospel, but they all of a sudden we're taught that in order to be justified, it wasn't just by faith, you had to do the works of the law. And so there's a tension in the church that Paul tries to address all through the book of Galatians in that we are not justified by works of the law, but we're justify, justified by faith. And so in this particular passage, namely it was circumcision. There was some people who came in and said that in order for the Gentiles to be actual believers, they had to be circumcised just like the Jews. And Paul said that had nothing to do with justification. And so there's this tension in the church, and, and people are not sure what to believe. And so out of this passage, two things that I want to focus on that are essential and really matter in the life of a Christian. The first thing that's very essential is that we are justified by faith and by faith alone, through grace in Christ Jesus. Paul talks about here, and if we look, he, he talks about it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of our own works that anybody may boast. 
And in Galatians, if we turn back a few chapters just to kind of summarize what he talks about, in Galatians chapter 2, we look at verse 15. Paul says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So when people came into the church and said, you need to be circumcised. This is what the law of Moses said. You need to be circumcised in order to be justified. Paul says, no, nobody will be justified by the works of the law. It is only through faith in Christ Jesus. And so he goes on a little bit further in chapter 3, verse 10. And here we understand why people won't be justified by the works of the law. In verse 10 of chapter 3, Paul says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Old Testament quoting. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming cursed for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul's arguing here with the people that came into the church of Galatia, saying that if you want to be justified by the law, you have to be able to keep the whole entire law. And there are like 600 commandments in the Old Testament, and they had to follow, right? They had to sacrifice, and there's, if you read through Leviticus and Numbers, and currently what I'm reading in my, in my daily devotional, I mean, there's law after law after law, and you had to sacrifice for this thing, and you had to sacrifice for that thing, and you had to sacrifice a certain way. And Paul's arguing that we no longer live by these laws, we no longer live under the mosaic or the law given to Moses as a means of justification. Now, this does not mean that we don't read or obey the Old Testament. The Old Testament is part of the Bible, it's part of the Word of God. But we have to filter the Old Testament through grace, through the New Testament, through Christ and what Christ has done. And so we look in the Old Testament, and Paul says, fine, if you want to be justified, it's not just circumcision. You have to obey everything. Now, we find a problem, and, and he talks about this in Romans and in Corinthians, where we are not able to keep all the commandments perfectly. All of us were born into sin. All of us sin on a daily basis. And so the Bible in James says that if you're guilty of one of these, you're guilty of the whole law. So by default, we automatically fail, and we cannot be justified. God gave a law to the people of Israel, a law by which they could not be justified. And it, it talks here about why he gave that law, but... That's for a different time and, uh, and topic. And so Paul's arguing that in order to be justified by the law, you have to keep the whole law, which is impossible to do. And so he argues and says that even the Old Testament, you know, in Habakkuk or Abraham, it says that Abraham believed and is counted to him as righteousness. It was faith, not works. And Abraham came 400 and something years before the law was given. And so even here in chapter um, 3, verse 11, it says the righteous shall live by faith. One of the most essential matters in the Christian faith is that we were redeemed by Christ Jesus and we are justified before him in faith, not by works of law, not by the things we do. Not one of us can come and tell God, I've done X, Y, and Z, and therefore I'm justifiable before you. We're only justified by faith in Christ. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household, you will be saved, the Bible says in Acts. If we don't have faith in Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter how many rules or customs or traditions we follow, we will never be justified before God. And so the first essential thing that we ought to understand, and what really matters, is that we are justified before God only through faith in Christ Jesus. Our theme for 2020 is following Christ. If we're not following Christ, and we're not believing in Christ, my friends, we're in, in, we're in peril for damnation to hell. Despite how many church attendants we go to, despite how many songs we sing, despite how much scripture we read, if we don't believe in Jesus, we won't make it to heaven. It doesn't matter what our status or our label is. And so this is the first essential thing, that we're justified by faith. Now Paul goes on a little bit further in chapter 5 and says in verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accounts for anything. Paul is not against circumcision. He himself was a Jew. He says, I'm not against circumcision, but it's not a matter of justification. He says, when it comes to Christ, in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. All that matters is faith working through love. And so when we start off and it says, for freedom, Christ has set us free in chapter 5. Stand there firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. We often think of that as being sin. But Paul here is referring to not submitting again to a rules and a standard of the Mosaic law for the Galatian church. 
He's telling them, you once followed rules and laws, but you've been justified by faith. You've been given a gift of salvation. Don't go back to the old way of thinking. And so he talks about faith working through love. If we want to fulfill the law, and we, we, don't, we still have a moral obligation to obey the commands of the law in Scripture. So you look in, in, in the Old Testament, and there's very clear uh, commandments. There's very clear things that were brought into the New Testament. And Christ even said, that, you know, the whole entire law and the prophets fall on two things. Loving the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And so God has freed us from the curse of the law. We can't keep the law. We're only justified by faith. And so if we're justified by faith, in order to live the law according to how Christ wanted us to live the law, it has to be through faith, working through love. And this is my second point. A second, and there's a lot of essential things in, in, in Scripture, but the other second essential thing that has been on my mind is uh, loving one another and, and pushing aside all of our differences as Christians. We had a, a question at, uh, at youth, um, and I think I still have it in my Bible, but essentially the question was saying that how can there be so many different beliefs and convictions, and yet everybody still believe in the same God or call themselves the Christian? And it's a very valid question that young people deal with. They say, I see so many different people who say they're Christians, who say they love Jesus, who say they believe, and yet they have different convictions and beliefs. How can this be so? Um, all of us will have certain convictions. Convictions are something that we're, we're personally brought into saying that I should not do this or that because it's not good. Now, convictions are not necessarily a sin that's labeled in Scripture. We ought not to preach convictions from the pulpit. We should just preach the Word of God. I have my own personal convictions that perhaps somebody else doesn't. And I'll give an example of this. If we turn to Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14... I'll read a few verses. Paul writes here, As for the one who is weak in faith, this is verse 1, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all the days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So Paul here is talking about, in the Roman, there, there was a dispute in the church between the weak and the strong. There are some Jewish people who say we shouldn't eat X, Y, and Z stuff because this is how the Jewish tradition had been. They have a lot of commandments in, in, in Leviticus and the Old Testament. You can't eat certain types of foods. Um, it's clear in the New Testament that God has done away with the commandments of what you can or cannot eat. But some people weren't convinced. We know of Peter when he had the vision of, of, of beast in the field and, and a voice said, eat Peter. And Peter said, I dare not eat what is not clean. And God says, do not call something that I have made clean unclean. And so we have, and even in Paul talks in Galatians about how we no longer follow these certain types of laws of what we should eat or should not eat. However, there are some people in the faith, brothers and sisters, who perhaps have been walking for years with the Lord or not so many years, who are fully convinced of certain things in their mind and say, I must abstain from this or I must abstain from that. While you have other brothers who say, I don't think that's bad. I don't know why you abstain from it. Now, we might not deal with days of the week or perhaps um, vegetables or, or, or food. But in more contemporary terms, we've all heard in, in all cultures, Romanian, American, um, I'll give you a small example, having a tie in church. Should we have a tie in church? Should we not have a tie in church? And my question is, is this essential for our spiritual state and our sanctification? And I'd submit to you that it's not essential. These are things that are convictions to each and one, every one of us. If, if, for example, Marius is here with us tonight, and he wears a tie to church, and I don't. The Bible says, if Marius has faith to wear a tie, he should not judge me for not wearing a tie, and I should not despise him for wearing a tie, or vice versa. Now, we can apply this to many other things, right? Should we wear a suit when we come to church? It's nice. It's great. We enjoy dressing up. Is it a matter of essential uh, things of Scripture? I don't think it is. 
Scripture doesn't tell us exactly how we ought to dress. It tells us we ought to dress modestly. It tells us we ought to dress to honor God. But that can be interpreted in different ways. And, and so we ought to look at our convictions to ourselves, what's clear in Scripture, leave it clear in Scripture, and not debate amongst us. In a time like this, it seems that instead of focusing on these little tiny non-essential things that we often debate with ourselves, instead of focusing on the most important things, a non-Christian who comes into this church, it is essential for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without the gospel, they cannot be saved. A newborn Christian who, who, who's young and perhaps just started walking in the faith, it is more essential for them to hear sound doctrine of scripture rather than to hear rules and customs that perhaps our parents had or perhaps we have as younger people. And I'm not just talking about the Romanian parents or, or American parents because there's a lot of young people that have differences in convictions. But our convictions are our convictions. Paul says here, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Paul had his own convictions. He goes on further in chapter 14 and says, I'm persuaded nothing is unclean in itself. But if somebody is fully persuaded that something is unclean, they shouldn't eat it. And, and further down, we talk a lot about not causing people to stumble. And if I have the opportunity to preach again, that'll be part two uh, of the sermon. But we don't know if we're going to have church again anytime soon. We don't. With the government, the way things are going, uh, we have virtual church right now. I, I mean, we don't know if we're going to have physical church here at the gathering that we're used to. But my prayer is that as we are in our homes, as we are, we're fellowshipping virtually online or maybe just in small groups, that we focus on the essential things of Scripture, that we focus on, on the doctrines of Scripture, the justification, sanctification, that we focus on obedience to God's Word. And we, and we leave aside the little arguments and debates that perhaps are not as essential to our spiritual state. In working with young people, I've realized I can tell a young person how to dress a million times, but you can wear a suit and still go to hell, and you can wear jeans and go to heaven. It does not matter to God as long as your heart is for Jesus. You know, oftentimes we, we like to say that if we go before the president, how would we dress? And, and to me, I always ask the question, why do we compare audience with the presidents to audience with God? When God looks at the heart, the Bible says. Everybody in the Old Testament, Samuel looked at David and said, him? But God said, you look on the outside, I look on the heart. And so I'm not, I'm not despising suits or ties. I enjoy dressing up just as much as the next person. But for the state of essential matters of the spiritual life, in the world we're facing, in the chaotic times, are these things that are so essential for us to bicker about? Or should we push them aside and, and, and focus on loving one another? You know, uh, the brother next to me maybe has a beard and I don't. Or I have a beard and he doesn't. Should we focus on who's right and who's wrong? We don't have clear scripture on these things. We don't. And yet we, we act like we do sometimes. And so in Galatians, Paul is saying in chapter 5, going back to Galatians, and I'd like to close with this. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Freedom from rules and rituals and traditions. But only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. If I feel free in a certain aspect, I shouldn't use that for my flesh, my, my pride, and to say that I'm right and you're wrong. That's not what the Bible's saying. He's saying, but through love, serve one another. And this ties into not causing a stumbling block before a brother. Obviously, if I go to Marius's house and he's fully convinced that um, eating uh, salmon is a sin, I'm not going to eat salmon. Right? These are clear concepts in Scripture, and they're essential because the Bible says I ought not to be a stumbling block. So as we go forward into, into the next months and the weeks and the years, I'd like to encourage us that we start focusing more on the essential things of Scripture. In, in Galatia, Paul spends the whole letter, and if you read the, the letter to Galatians, I mean, he's, he's frustrated with the Galatians. In chapter 3, he even says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He's telling them, who, who caused you to believe such a non-insignificant thing when you started by the Spirit? And perhaps all of us at one point start a certain way and we, we've developed convictions, we've lost convictions. I pray tonight that, that we would have a better focus on the essential matters of Scripture. To be able to speak to young people, to be able to speak to one another, to serve one another in love. We cannot say that we love Jesus if we do not love one another. 
if we don't love the brother or the sister next to us, regardless if we agree with them on all matters of scripture, um, Jonathan, my friend Jonathan, uh, he, he has a word. There, there are the close things, close fist things of gospel that you cannot debate, right? Justification by faith. There's no way around it. That's a close fist. There's no if, and, or buts. You can't discuss it. You can't debate it. That's just what it is, the Bible says. And there's open things, right? Like what foods you should eat or if you should have a beard or if you should wear a tie or not wear a tie. These are open things. We don't have a clear-cut description in Scripture about them. Now, if the local church has rules, we ought to follow those rules because we submit to authority. But in our families tonight and moving forward, if we get the chance, if we get the grace from God to be able to meet back again as a church in this building, I pray that we would, we would have a better focus, a more renewed focus on the essential matters of scriptures. Because it doesn't matter if we've been Christians for a long time, uh, we can still be babes in Christ. We, we see in scripture where it says, you know, the Bible says in, in Hebrews where you ought to have be eating meat, you're still drinking milk. Um, it, it doesn't make sense. For us, we think if, like I gave the example at, at young people on a Wednesday night, um, my son, God bless uh, my wife and I with a son, and, and he drinks milk. That's his food all the time. Now, if I invited somebody over and, and I gave them a bottle with milk, they would think I, I've gone crazy. Because it doesn't make any sense. An adult doesn't drink bottle with real milk or doesn't nurse. He eats food. He eats meat. Now, my son can't eat meat. If you give him meat, it's going to be a bad, bad situation for everybody. So we all have different stages in life. And Paul says, for the one who is weak, do not despise if you have stronger faith. For the one who is strong, let not the weak judge. He's calling all of us to look at ourselves, to check ourselves, to love one another. If my brother's struggling in something and, and he's fully convinced of something, let me love on him and make sure that I don't cause him to stumble. If I have a conviction and my brother doesn't, let me not judge him because it's not my right to judge him. We have a right to call each other out as brothers and sisters in Christ if we're living in sin. If my brother sees me sin, the Bible says try to restore and support. Save that person from the sin. But convictions are not necessarily sins except for the person who believes that in themselves. And so I pray that as we, as we go forward tonight, we will focus on these two essential aspects of, of our Christianity and our faith. That we're justified by faith in Christ Jesus, not works of the laws. We can't do anything to, to be justified before God. We can't um, accumulate any sort of merit before God. Jesus already did that. For me to say that I can be justified by some of the works I do is to diminish what Christ has done at the cross. Christ has already completed the work of salvation at the cross. There's nothing for me to add to it. Nothing I could add to it. And secondly is to, to love one another as brothers, as sisters in Christ, to allow our differences to be put to the side and to focus on the essential matters of Scripture, especially in loving God and loving one another. Amen. May God bless.